Hi, my name is Travis Lindsay. I'm here for the Center for Entrepreneurship at Cal State Fullerton. And today I'm interviewing one of our newest members of the CSUF entrepreneurship community, uh, Karen Kaspalch. Uh, Karen, can you please introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about how you uh, got connected with us? Sure. Um, thanks, Travis. So uh, I've got a, a background in engineering. So mechanical engineer from MIT, MBA from Harvard Business School. And I actually spent 24 years at General Motors in different, different roles, including managing a shift at a vehicle assembly plant, uh, 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 doing strategy and production uh, organization and quality work in Singapore for Asia Pacific, um, and then finished my GM career as a VP of purchasing for Allison Transmission. And I was at Allison and part of the leadership team when GM sold Allison right before the financial crisis. And after about a year, I realized that I wanted to do something else with my life. So I left Allison, um, but I left like probably about five months before the, the financial crisis in 2008. So I took the summer off, I was interviewing all set. And then all of a sudden, everything just blew apart, locked down, and I was without a job. So I, I actually was on the board at our kids' international school. I went to the board president and said, no one's hiring. Is there something I can do? And so he, he said, look, we just, uh, we just developed and approved a marketing plan and we've got nobody at the school who can implement it. So would you be willing to do that? And I'm like, sure. I don't know anything about marketing, but why not? And it was interesting because after 24 years at GM, I had forgotten how much I liked doing new things and learning new things. So I, I learned how to, how to develop a marketing plan and implement it. And in fact, I'll tell you that 15 years later, the school is still using the branding um, and all the work that I that 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 we implemented uh, 15 years ago. So it was it was solid, but it reminded me that I like doing other things. So um, you know, friend of a friend introduced me to uh, a board member of a startup company. And he's like, hey, I think you might be pretty good at entrepreneurship. <laughs> and I looked at him, I said, I've never been the idea person. I, I don't know that I'm a good fit for that. And he said, look, there there's three things that you need to have for, for, you know, for a good company, a good entrepreneurial company. You need to have the idea. Well, there's a lot of people with a lot of good ideas. You need to have money. And there's there's a whole network of how to get money. But the hardest and most complicated thing is you need to have someone who can actually manage the entire business. And he said, I think you could be really good at that. So I joined the company and after about three months, we ran out of cash. Now, I didn't even understand how to manage, how to look at cash flows because working at GM, you have a budget and you know people sort of magically get paid. So that was the first thing that I learned is like cash flow is king when you're in a startup company. Yeah, it's pretty important. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. So, you know, it was an interesting role because I was I was uh, you know, I was a VP of purchasing at Allison. And this company was was really um I'd say business intelligence for purchasing organizations. So I looked at the technology and I said, gosh, this is exactly what I wish I had when I was a VP of purchasing. So, okay, great. Met up with, with our major customer. And, and so three months in, when we ran out of cash, I, I, I drove down to them and I said, okay, you see me every week for the past three months. You see my vision for the business but I can't make payroll. So what do you think? You know, do you want, do you want me just to shut down or do you want us to keep going? And 
they looked at me and they said, oh, we, we love your vision. We want you to keep going. And so we kept that business going for another, another three years. But at the end of the day, we really couldn't find anyone other than this major customer. We had a few customers here or there, but nothing to really turn that into a business. And so uh, finally, we sold the technology and then, then I moved on. So uh, a couple of things. So the the three things that you were taught told about, you know, good idea, money, someone to manage the entire business. Uh, obviously, the the money part ran out. Uh, you you managed the business. It sounds like you did a good job at that. Uh, what so what what was the problem? Was it just the, the lack of money? Uh, maybe the idea needed some working on. What 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 do you think it was? So it was, you know, I mean, I and I think as I as I look at many of my startup experiences, you've got great technology, but not something that wants to turn into a business. Right. And, and so this was a really great kind of cool technology, but let me tell you what the sales process is. I would walk in to a head of purchasing and I'd say, hello, Mr. Purchasing Vice President. I have this great, company that I can help identify all the bad decisions that you and your purchasing guys made in terms of negotiating prices with 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 your your supply base right and and so at the end of the day I I could only find one or two customers right and it was always tied into somebody that was secure enough that they were okay understanding what they did wrong, right? Yeah. Or or it was someone who was brand new who could blame the previous guy. Gotcha. Yeah, it's it, it's kind of a tough sell, right? I mean, it's like, right. like hey, uh, you're making a lot of mistakes and we know what those mistakes are. And so uh, hire us. Right. And, you yeah. know, and we tried, okay, let's go talk to the CFO because a CFO would love to get this information, but the CFO would look at it and say, ah, who, who are these people? And I need, I need my head of purchasing to validate that what you're telling me is right. So there was no way to go to anyone but the head of purchasing. Gotcha. All right, so uh, you you did this for three years. Uh, yep. So you employed people for three years. You made money for three years, and that's that. that I you know personally, I, I would say that's a success. You know, I I, I think uh, most people who maybe even some people who are watching this may s say that oh well, I mean the business failed, right? I mean, but that's that's I mean that's part of the story. But you know, in between there was a, a successful business going on for a couple of years. So where well, I, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. You know, you know, and, I, and what I was going to tell you is that was the hardest thing for me to deal oh, with, that. Again, right? Yeah. Which is, oh my gosh, I'm a failure. And, and, you know, it was interesting because I sat down with, um, in, in a, in a, you know, in a different startup, I was talking to the lawyers from that company and, you know, I'm like, gosh, do you see this as a failure? And he looked at me, he's like, Karen, that was a dead business. You kept it going for three or four years. This is this is what happens in startup companies. There's no way anyone who understands startups would look at it as a failure. And so to your point, I had to readjust my thinking and understand that even if you have a great idea, there's a lot of pieces that you have to fit together, whether it's having enough money or really figuring out a good go-to-market process um, to, you know, to really determine, okay, do you, do you really have something? Yeah, uh, 100%. It, it's not like you got the reins of Berkshire halfway and, and ran it into the ground, you know, so it's, right. it's, it's slightly different. Yeah, and uh, the the one thing that I would add to those three things that you mentioned about you know the success of an uh, of an entrepreneurial venture, you know, good idea, money, somebody to manage it, is also the timing part of it. So, did you think that per perhaps that maybe the timing wasn't you know optimal for it? Maybe if that business idea were to come around now with people more 
open to uh, AI intervention and stuff like that, maybe it would have more success now. So, so maybe, but the, uh, what, what was interesting is that the underlying technology required that we scrape data from CAD files. And, and we were, we were in the middle of cloud just starting and people being, and, and most of these companies being really afraid of cloud-based things. And, and then the other side of companies starting to realize, hey, this is our core intellectual property. We don't want to let another company have access to it. And so, so it was, you know, this really cool idea that, I think the only way this could have been successful is if I had been with the business five years when, it, you know, at, at the very beginning, because they raised $5 million, but they spent the money on something that didn't align with what customers needed. Yeah. Yeah, five, right. uh, five million dollars for everybody who's listening to this who hasn't gone through the process. Uh, turns out not to be that much money uh, in a startup context because you got people to pay, and a lot of these people they're engineers making you know low six figures, maybe mid six figures, and uh, there's a lot of other expenses that go into, it, especially you know when you did this back when was this like 2009, 2010. Yeah, yeah. So there, yeah. there was office space that you definitely had to pay for. You're probably still paying for it now, but definitely back then. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, that that five million dollars that that doesn't provide you with much of a runway. I mean, it's it's maybe a a few years. Yeah, and y you know, and I think I think the real key was that they had the wrong leader when they had the money, mm -hmm. and then when when I joined, it's like it was a good strategy, but it was there just wasn't enough money to to keep things going. Yeah, that's tough. And uh, that's something that, I mean, not to go off too much on a tangent here, but a lot of uh, startups like right now, they're, they're facing that. They're, they, right. they're, they were raising money off the model of, oh, well, we're, we're going to be able to raise another couple of million dollars in 18 months. And uh, that money's kind of dried up a little bit right now. And right. so they're, they're having to, you know, switch their business plan, trying to uh, bring that profitability up to now as as quickly as possible and uh it's kind of hard to do uh so uh yeah the, just a little tangent uh okay I'm, you, I'm sorry, you know, the, other, the other thing i tell you is that there was a time probably in the last like maybe 10 years where people were willing to work for under market because they were going to get equity and i also think that time has moved on um, you know, people really want to work for as close to our market as possible. Um, you, you know, you may have a few people who are like, oh, I'm, I'm still living with my parents. I can, I don't have to get paid a whole lot, but, but most of the people we've talked to, they actually want, they want to make market. That makes sense. Uh, because I mean, most venture backed, uh, uh, firms, they don't end up getting acquired or they don't end up going, they definitely, I mean, almost never end up going public anymore. And right. if they do, it's usually through a, a SPAC, you know, a special, uh, I forget the acronym right yeah, at the right. moment, a uh, special purchase acquisition uh, company. Uh, yeah, right. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, a lot of that equity ends up being worth zero. Right. Which, yeah, which isn't great for somebody who, you know, maybe graduated from MIT and Harvard and, you know, could go and work for a GM or, uh, uh, you know, uh, a financial company or whoever making hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Listen, you know, I'm, I am, you know, since I've left GM, it's like, it's just money has been tight. I need, I have my expenses. I had kids in college. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I luckily my first 24 years, I saved, you know, 10 plus percent of my salary 
and I have an IRA, but that's pretty much, you know, I have got, I've got an IRA, I've got, I've got a car and that's pretty much the only assets I have. And so it, it does make it more complicated being an older entrepreneur because, you know, I, I am not going to go live in, you know, in a house with 10 other people. Um, and it, it's still expensive to live. Yeah. Uh, definitely don't want to do that. I, I, I would never want to do that at any time in my life. That, that just sounds like hell, but I, I, I get it. Uh, people have to do it. I mean, that's what you sometimes have to do. If, if you want to start a business at that moment, you know, Hey, you're going to have to make sacrifices and you're right. It is tough. Uh, so speaking of tough, okay. The business closes, Right. What's the next step in your entrepreneurial journey? So, um, so at that time, I was uh, a member of the board of the Indianapolis Airport, and okay, um, I'm sure there's a story behind that, but uh... great, great story. But it's an award-winning airport, still is an award-winning airport, and uh, uh, if you've never flown through Indianapolis, um, the trick is that everybody in the airport is completely focused on the company or on, 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 on the customer. So if you, if, and I've tested this enough times, if you walk in the airport and within 30 seconds, you're looking around, somebody on the staff there will come up and say, can I help you? And, and that somebody probably 80% of the time is a member of the janitorial staff. So they, they've they just developed this great experience walking through. So, all right, so I, I just, I have to make a plug for Indianapolis Airport because it's such a great place. No, and, and you know, just, uh, just so you know, pretty much every time I fly, I'm the guy who gets taken out of the security line, who gets the extra special treatment. So, I mean, I, I, I get it. I, I, I love airports and uh, uh, how they, pay a lot more attention to certain customers. It's just, it's just <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. It's not that kind of paying attention though. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So, so, uh, uh, one of the investors from the previous company was walking through the airport and saw my picture on the wall. And he said, Oh, I need to call Karen. I've got this startup company that I've invested in. I think she'd be great for the company. So he called me up, hey, what are you doing? And I'm kind of like, Ugh. and and he's like, hey, I've got this company in California. Um, a bunch of guys from, from Indiana have started this company. They're in California now. And uh, uh, I think you'd be a great fit for them. Um, you know, they're looking for someone with, with, with a production background. Why don't you come and, 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 and talk to them? So I went out, interviewed, uh, and it's like, wow, this is a very intriguing company. It was a 3D metal printer. Um, they were trying to, to take the metal printer to the next level. Um, they, you know, they had raised, here we go, they had raised $6 million. Um, so it's like, okay. And this was the first of many, many moves. And, and, uh, we were we were in the process of trying to sell our house in Indianapolis anyway. Um, both kids were in college, so we wanted to downsize. And uh, so I told my husband, "How would you like to go out to uh, uh, you know Northern California? Let's do the startup company." He's like, "Hey, you know, have at it." And okay, great. So I go out there. We find a place to live. Um, we go from fifty five hundred square foot. Uh, five bedroom, three car garage house to a 1200 square foot, two bedroom, two bathroom apartment. Yeah, that's a, a little bit smaller. I'm guessing probably somewhere really, really close to San Francisco. Uh, yeah, yeah, San yeah. Mateo, but yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so we get out there and you know I'm I'm talking to customers. We have we have a a technology agreement that we're working on and but I also have things back in the Midwest we're trying to sell the house you know trying to make the move 
So one of my, every time I take a trip back, whether it's to focus on customers or for personal reasons, something would happen negatively at the comp at the company. And I come back and kind of try to bring it all together. And finally, I was in the Midwest. Uh, my daughter was graduating from college and I get a call and all of the engineers had quit. What happened? Well, uh, I, let, I gotta think how I wanna tell this story. So um, they completely lost trust in the company founder. I mean, like okay. deeply, completely lost trust. So I'm, I'm, I'm at a, I'm at a, I'm at a show and I'm spending my whole time on the phone talking to the key guy, trying to figure out, well, what happened? What happened? And he's like, this guy's not been telling the truth. Right. And, and it's like that, that's probably the shortest version, um, without telling too many stories out of, out of, out of right. school. Yeah. Um, I mean, he was pretty much lying about everything. That's not good, especially no. in, a, in a startup. You know, I mean, there, you, you don't really have much. Uh, trust needs to be one of those things. And even if things are going bad, I mean, like we, we like like we talked about. I mean, uh, people understand. People in the startup business understand that. Hey, you know that that runway that we thought we were going to have, you know, money for the next eighteen months, it's actually going to be twelve. So we need to raise a little right. bit more money. And. Uh, people understand that and especially if you're upfront about it then that, that that's good but yeah i mean once you lose trust i mean it's it's hard it's hard to regain that trust in most contexts but i mean especially in in startups yeah so so then it's like what happened so i came back and we were actually uh housed in a in an accelerator environment so you've got the investors right there and they're like, okay, what can we do to help? And I'm looking around and, you know, the engineers have left and, 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 and the CEO, the founder, the two co-founders are still around. And I'm thinking to myself, how, how do I do anything? I can't run this business, even though I'm kind of the, the most experienced person, because there's no team for me to manage. And how do you do it with these two guys still around? And, and so I'm like, I don't know how I can be the CEO, but in the meantime, I'm talking to the, the main engineer, trying to see if I can bring him back into the business. So he, so, so the investors basically said, you need to go, go ahead and lead a CEO search and you need to lead. Uh, you need to lead uh, uh, a chief engineer search. So, you know, spent a whole bunch of money going down that path. And finally, I came back and said, "Look, I'm I uh, I'm okay being being the interim CEO as part of this process." And and at the same time, I managed to bring back to two of the three engineers, right? And here's the other funny story is that I embarrassed the investor who was convinced that I would not be able to do both, either one of those things, enough that they decided they had to fire me. Well, that's pretty good. Because I, embar I embarrassed them too much. Okay. Right? And, and, you know, here's another lesson. It's like, don't embarrass your investors. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean you know, so, they're human beings, you know, don't think right. just because they have money that they care more about the company than who they are inside. Yeah, I, I, I get that. But, you know, as um, so in my background, I, th I think we talked about this previously, but I've uh, co-founder of a couple of admittedly small scale investment funds and uh I mean that that just comes with the territory, though, from the investor perspective. I mean, that, that you, you're going to have, uh, and I, I'm sure you didn't do it on purpose. I'm sure it wasn't, you know, uh, you, you you didn't mean to make a point or anything like that. It just it just happened. 
Uh, but, you know, there's also founders who definitely do want to make a point and do it, you know, publicly and uh, try to embarrass you. And, you know, that's just part of the process. You right. may you cut that person off, but you're not going to, you know, uh, you know, do do anything else uh, about it. You're not there, there's there's not going to be any retribution like you would see in like The Godfather or something like that. Yeah, just, right. right. Yeah. And usually the uh, the the founder who does that something's wrong anyways and so yeah but I mean it sounds like your situation was significantly different no you know it was just I kept doing the impossible right the impossible and the improbable and and it was kind of this bet that no way you can do this and then I would pull it off and and you know at the end of the day it's like you know well guess what you know a month and a you know a year and a half later the company's out of money and they shut down and and it just it 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 was what it was right yeah i mean it's uh, that's unfortunate so uh what's next what's the next step is is it a is it a better step is it a worse step tell us about it so so i am going to tell you from my perspective there's no such thing as a bad step okay because everything, you know, if I, when I look back and I say, oh, you know, I had, a, I had classmates who were like, oh, Karen, you should be running startup companies, you know, 30 years ago. And, and, but I wouldn't be who I am. I wouldn't have the family that I have if I had done that. So there is this aspect of, oh, if only, but the, the, pretty much for me, the only if only would have led to money and not led to everything else. And at the end of the day, everything else is way more important than right. money has well, been. And, and it might have led to money. And it and might, it not. might have led, led yeah. to money. Yeah, but it, it, it might not. It, the, yeah. the reality though is you know, in in the in the early 80s, 90s, uh, say the early 90s, in Silicon Valley, there was a lot more opportunity. It's more complex opportunity now, but there was a lot of opportunity then. Yeah, there was there was definitely a lot more. I mean, that that was before my time a little bit. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, there there was there was less competition because it, well, it was still and, and that's pretty the point. Yeah. and a lot less competition, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, so so I had been talking to a lot of different people, and they said, Karen, you know what you should do is find a company that's five to 10 million in sales, hardware company um, that, that they're looking for the adult person to kind of grow the company to the next level. So right before um, I was let go of the previous company, I got a call from a headhunter. Um, oh, here's this company. They're shooting for 10 million. They've got you know, they've got just got an investment of, you know, five to six million, very, very profitable, and they need a COO. Are you interested? And it's like, yeah, why not? Right. Um, and so, you know, timing was just like I I was I was off for a month and a half, and then I'm at, at the next company, Las Vegas. So picture another move. Um and slightly different from uh, San Mateo slightly different right yeah. and uh you know really interesting company um i came in and within i would say within a week i'm like okay where are we on inventory trying to just understand what's happening in the business and they they made they bought all of the raw material from china so hardware company bought all the raw material from China and uh, uh, would assemble it in house. And what they would do is they would buy three months worth of material and it would come in and they're like, oh, good, we got three months to go. But there was no thought about how long the supply chain was. Yeah, lead time is, uh, is slightly important. Slightly important, right? Yeah. So all of a sudden I realized, oh, 
this, you've got two weeks. We need to like get that and airship it now to keep the business going. This, you have a month, so you have a little bit more time. And then you need to start ordering more regularly so that you're not, you know, even if you wait, if it shows up, that means you need to make the next order immediately, right? Like put put some flow into the order process. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of entrepreneurship is setting up these interlocking systems that all work together and, you know, make the business run smoothly, even if you're not there. Because, hey, guess what? As the founder or the CEO or what, whatever the case may be, if you're one of the leaders in a startup, especially one that's raising money, you're going to be spending a lot of time, you know, raising money. Exactly. Uh, that, 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 that's something that I think a lot of, uh, of uh, entrepreneurs don't realize is that, I mean, if you are raising millions of dollars, that's pretty much a full-time job. It, it is, it's, it's absolutely a full-time job, yeah. right? So, so literally if I had been a week later, the business would have, would have imploded. Yeah. Timing. I mean, that, it, yeah. it was just like, what? So we got the systems in place really, ha I mean, we had, I, gosh, I, I feel like, I mean, it was a huge increase in sales that year. You know, we kept production going, we brought out a new product and I got upside down with the um, with the owner's wife, who also worked in the business. You know, and yeah, just it, it, it just happens, and there's not a whole lot that you can do about it. Um, you know, it, there was there was an issue with something that didn't get ordered. It created a problem with the customers, and I'm like, okay. Let's figure out what happened so that we can we can solve this so it doesn't happen again. And she took it personally. That's unfortunate. Okay, so is, is so, did, did, did that uh, foretell the end for you there? Oh or? yeah, yeah. Okay. So she declared war, um, and you know it, I I I could have fought it, but right. it just you know it's like she's she's the owner's wife. You yeah. know, the last thing I want to do is create a problem between a husband and a wife. It, it's just so awkward, right? You're, you're, you're not going to win that one. And even if you do win it, it's going to be a pure victory. And it's, yeah, it's going to be a loss in the end anyway. So, right. There, there are people who could have fought that. I, I was not that person. And, and, you know, there are also people who, who could have gone to her and said, oh, I was wrong. I'm so sorry. And I'm kind of like, no, you were wrong. <laughs> You know, I'm trying, I'm trying to keep the business going and, and, you know, that's, that's my focus. Um, so was I as sensitive as I needed to be? Uh, absolutely not, but you know, things happen. So, so basically my, my mother-in-law had just lost, uh, her husband and she was dealing with real short-term memory loss issues. So not Alzheimer's, but, and, you know, it's like, okay, here's my excuse. I'm going to, I'm going to leave the job. Here's my notice. Everything was wrapped up before I left. And, and I decided that, you know, let me take some time off, support my mother-in-law um, with my husband, and then look for, look for what's next. And so, uh, you know, what's next was another startup. Uh, and I'll, I'll just, the short version is um, the, the founder was, uh, came from academia. And- uh, uh, Somebody from academia, although in a little bit of a different uh, path, they're the worst. Right. And, I mean, the best, they're, 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 they're the best, they're the best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there are some that are great, and there are some that aren't great. Absolutely, yeah. I'm right, joking, and yeah. her her perspective, her perspective was um was uh that uh uh you know she wanted to stand in front of the group of people that she had, yeah. and she she pulled in some top notch people. She wanted to stand in front of them and educate them and lecture them. So, so, you know, I stuck it out, but every three months, we were six months away from being ready to raise. Okay. 
And at the end of six months, it's like, there is no future in this company. Yeah. So it's just continually, it's going to happen. It's just going to happen. It's going to happen. I mean, no, nobody updates the, you know, launching in six months uh, timer. And it just, you know, it goes from July right. to August to September. Right. It's always right. six months away. Yeah. 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 I've, 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 I've seen some of that. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's tough. I mean, as somebody who has been in many startups yourself, I mean, you, you could attest it. It's, it. it's tough. I mean, and so having a great idea isn't the only part of it. Having a great leadership isn't, the only, isn't you know the main thing or, I mean it could be but it, it's not the only thing either you have to have that uh, quality where you actually launch and that, that yeah. that's a separate kind of a skill set really yeah 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 and she had people around her that wanted to launch and anytime she got threatened she 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 moved them out right that's and not, okay it, it's just like okay and so you know, I, I was still part of the company, but but I I was out looking, found this opportunity uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. So, you know, start just move, move, move. Um, so from a Hoosier to Golden State to Nevada, Nevada. back to being a Hoosier and now yeah. now being now being a Badger. OK. All right. <laughs> All right. So I. Uh, you know, interesting company, great technology, and they were looking for they were looking for uh, 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 someone, you know, who had the business side. You know, they had they had money at least to get started. I joined, you know, and and this is this is where I went through kind of the uh, uh, the I core experience. So they had an SBIR. We went through the process. We went forward with with uh, you know our phase two proposal. Um, uh, was able to raise some money, not a lot, but about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So we raised some funds and got the program into uh, TechStars. So we did. And that's tech a huge accomplishment, just which so is which idea. is a huge deal, yeah. right? Huge deal. So get get into TechStars. Um, you know, at demo day, like somebody walked up and said, I want to write you a check for $25,000. I'm like, okay, I'll take the money. No problem. And in the meantime, for, for two years, I had been negotiating with the same major corporation that had been the funder of my first, that first startup. Okay. Okay. So, right. you know, it's like, I think I got something interesting. Take a look. Oh, we're interested. Yes, yes, yes. So kind of like two years, because this is, I mean, sometimes it takes corporations that long to, 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 to settle things, yep. you know? So came back from Techstars and one of my board members who had invested some additional funds into the business, but he wanted to do it in monthly tranches the day before Christmas said after after three tranches i'm not making any more investment that's tough okay yeah so so all right i'm still like let me see if i can close this deal we get to this deal and the day of my penultimate uh meeting with the lawyers all right we're really close let's get this thing done uh, my lawyers, my lawyers said, uh, we can't do this. We're afraid we're not going to get paid. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that night I had a heart attack. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Right. And, and, and it, it, it was, so you know, I'm, I, I go, I go to the ER, you know, EKG fine. They take your blood. And it turns out, gosh, I know all these things about having a heart attack. It turns out that when cardiac cells die, they emit a, 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 a chemical that you can pick up in a blood test. Okay. So they picked up the chemical. Yes, it was very minor and there is no damage. They did well, all the good. stuff. They did good. the catheterization. Oh, guess what? You have no signs of heart disease. Wow. 
So this so, is all just stress. All stress. Yeah. All stress. And when you think about broken heart, like something happens and it breaks your heart. It's like, yeah. oh, it really does break your heart. Yeah, 100 percent. And that's that's literal, too. I mean, the, the heart's one of the uh, one of the organs that can't repair itself. So if there's any damage to it, it's just scar tissue. Right. And so, yeah. And, and yeah, 100 percent. So yeah. that must have been terrifying on top of terrifying. So that was that was terrifying. And, uh, you know, the board wasted no time, uh, you know, in less than a week. I was no longer the CEO of the company and, wow. and, uh, uh, there was all kinds of, I would say things that happened that were not totally clean. Um, and, uh, and by the way, that was, that was February, 2020. Oh, Okay, so this okay. was right before everything shut down for a couple of years. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> and and the ironic thing is, two weeks before, I I was in Vegas for a meeting. Two weeks before the heart attack, I was in the Vegas for a different meeting, and I met up with a couple of guys who had started a robotics company, and. They sat me down and they said, hey, we want you to be CEO of the company. And I'm like, oh, I got this other obligation I've raised for them. And they're like, well, just, you know, we we need keep keep us in the loop, but we we want we want you to be CEO. OK. And so <laughs> I have a heart attack. You know, they pull me down, but I'm I'm behind the scenes and they're like, you don't have to work. And I'm like. I, I'm less stressed if I help you get through this process, right? My co-founder. And he called me up on March 11th. You know what March 11th was? Uh, that was, I, I'm, I'm going to guess that was either the day that Tom Hanks came down with it or the NBA closed down. That's the day they called the global pandemic. Okay. So he called me on March 11th and said, I'm resigning. And at that point, you know, global pandemic, you know, what do you do, right? Yeah. And, and there, there, there wasn't exactly a playbook. It was sort of there like- There was no playbook, yeah, right? Let, let, let's just try to figure this out as we go and, you know, to varying degrees of success. Yeah. So, so bottom line is, you know, I'm talking to the, the, uh, the founder board rep and he's like, yeah, with, with this guy leaving- um, you know, you're, you're on the block, you know, so it's going to happen on Friday. What do you want to do? Okay. Yep. So I, I, I resigned because I was going to get fired anyway, but it gave me some ability to control the process. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, so then, then it's like, I called the guys in Vegas, a robot company and they're like, great. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. So it, you know, it was, it was complicated. I mean, I started working virtually for them in April and, you know, when things kind of opened up right after Labor Day, you know, I told my husband, we better, you know, I, I think it's going to open and then close back down again. I'd rather just get on the road, move to Vegas. They've got a place for us to stay. Um, and, rather than be up here and not get down that way. And so we made that move, worked for them. And, and I guess the best thing I could say is it was very clear that the founders didn't want an operational CEO. Okay. They wanted to continue to kind of invent and right. didn't want to bring the structure in and they had been going down a path of, of evaluating a sale, decided to go through with the sale. But prior to that, they were selling uh, licenses for production and sales of the robot. So everything but R&D, I would say. And I met during that time, one of their investors we really, really hit it off. And we decided we would 
we would invest in in uh, a production license and build a business around it. So at that point, we made the last, hopefully for a while, geographical move um, and came came to Southern California and started building Arcatas, uh, which is this very interesting robot. And what's the technology is interesting because uh, uh, typically a robot, it wants to go to the same place over and over again. And you get repeatability through very precise mechanical parts, which means starting, you know, getting into business, building, building robots is, is very, very expensive. Yeah. This guy in, in, in Nevada had invented a way to get repeatability through uh, electronic feedback. So it's checking its location at each joint, giving electronic feedback. And if it's a little bit off, there's an adjustment that happens. Gotcha. So it's sort of like a localized GPS system, sort of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. that, that's a great way to put it. And so what what that means is that's generated this interesting opportunity to rethink rethink your production process because you don't need a big capital factory all the structural parts for the robot are 3d printed that changes things a little bit it changes things a lot right yeah. and so so let me let me wrap around. I talked about being in vehicle, you know, running a shift in a vehicle assembly plant. All right. People in that plant would spend every 65 seconds, they went back and did the same job again. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the reality is that human beings, we're not designed to do that. No. And and so when you have large factories of people who are doing the same thing every 65 seconds, what you have is a large factory of frankly very, very miserable people. Right. And I'm assuming that there's mistakes quite frequently that are getting made along the way because you're doing the same thing over and over again. If something were to change the routine, even a slight, a bit, a slight bit, I mean, things are going to get out of whack. Right. I mean, there's people who just, this is a good job. I'm going to come in. I'm going to do it. They never bother you. And there's other people that are, you know, it's like, let's create trouble. Right. And the people who are the ultimate leaders, they go, they go to one of two places. They either become part of the management or they become part of the union, right? And the, and the okay. union leadership, right? And 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 you know, here's the reality: when you've got a union environment and you've got a troublemaker, it's the union rep's job to to represent the troublemaker. Right. Yeah. The the, the union basically has a fiduciary obligation to you know. Uh, protect the, the members. That's right. Yeah. And so you just have this real disconnect that some of the strongest leaders are really not doing things on behalf of the company. They're doing something on behalf of their constituents. And it's very complicated. Yeah, 100%. Right? And, and it's like, I tried to have a decent relationship with 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 all the union reps. I had better better relationship with some than others, but you know when you really understand how complicated it is on their side, um, you know it, it's it's I I wouldn't say I'm anti union because I I, I very much understand the need, but when you have two organizations neither of which are completely focused on the end goal, which is the company, you just, it's hard to get good things to happen. Gotcha. So now back to right. uh, our, so, our, our so, architects. So, yeah. Right. So when I, when I, when I 
started looking at what are we going to do in Architas, I wanted to do multiple things. One is have a very small environment so that people felt obligated to each other. Number two was I wanted to create jobs that even though, yeah, you're doing the same thing, there's enough variation that you, you, you could feel good at the end of the day versus bad. And then the third thing is I wanted to create an environment where people had, people knew they were valued and they were bringing their brains as well as their physical bodies to the job. Gotcha. Okay. So that they're valued, that there's some variability and that they're, they're right. connected with everybody. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so we created this concept of having micro factories that, that then you could put them near your customer base and do all of the, all of the repair work, the service work from that customer base or, you know, from that micro factory and that the people who came in, they learn how to build the robots, they have upward mobility. So, you know, they can, they can, they can become a master builder. Um, they could become a trainer. Um, they could be installing robots. They could learn how to program the robot. So I wanted to create this opportunity for upward mobility in the factories, right? So, so that's, that's what we created with Architas. And in the meantime, it's like, we saw this need as, you know, as we're researching and looking at understanding automation or robotics, everything else, we saw two needs. One is that uh, by 2030, there's going to be 2 million unfilled manufacturing jobs in the U.S. alone. Wow. Right? That's a lot. That is, it's a ton, right? And, and so that's number one. And number two, uh, it's like, what's going to happen? Well, companies are not going to sit around with unfilled jobs. They can't. They're, they're right. going to look for automation. Right. And then the question is, who's going to actually run and manage the automation in these companies? And that's where we wanted to be a part of that process. And so we started just talking to community colleges and identify, you know, it's like started off of, we've got this great robot. And they're like, no, 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 we don't have curricula. We don't, you know, if you could bring something that's easy, easy to, to train and to use, then we'll talk to you about your robot. So we built curriculum and and so we're 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 at this place where we've got a nice little solid uh, uh, product market fit. You know, our you know we're still you know we've got people uh, two universities who've who've who bought the robot, um, teaching the curriculum. There's a lot of feedback, you know, and looking to expand a little bit. But the real key is is the curriculum. And then behind it, this concept of how do you how do you start helping people understand what good leadership means, what it's like to work in an environment where yeah you're building things, but you're also being valued as part of that process. Yeah, and and that's one of the things you you know your your background right now is is your values, and I and I think everybody knows that that's a a, a picture behind you right now, but it's also you know part of your uh, I, I saw it uh, at, at your uh, company location. It's it's there, right? It's it, it's the first room. So, uh, how much of a role do the values play in all this? Oh, it it you know it's everything, and right. and it, it's it, it I, I'll just tell you it's everything. And when, when we interview people, we're doing a value check after we validate that they're capable of doing the job. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that that's something that um, I, I've talked with a lot of founders about, and it, it's that okay, it's good that you know how to do the job, but that's that we, we could train you how to do that. Uh, but if you have the same values, that that's what we're looking for. And it's, it sounds like you're kind of on board with that. Uh, we're you know, and and it's interesting because it's like when times when things go badly, from a, especially financially when when you have strong values the team wants to coalesce not right. not scatter right? right and 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 just having this grounding and it's as simple as when we when we were looking for janitorial staff for the office uh i had two options and one option was a company that was just a, I'd say a shell company. And the other option was a company that the people who did the work were all employed. And we we looked at it and it's like, oh, wait, this shell company doesn't align with our values. We want to work with a company that shares these values. I mean, and but it means you have to stop and say, huh, hiring this shell company, is that part of our values? And when the answer is no, we need to keep looking. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, that, that's a perfect example. I'm about ready to say, I mean, it, it could take up a little bit more time up front, but over the long run, it just saves you a lot of time, saves you a lot of headache. And if everybody's aligned values wise, I mean, it just, it makes things run more smoothly and better and, and all that other stuff. And I mean, like what you're doing with Arkitos, uh, it's, it's, it's basically like you're making that part of everything that you do from the education to the building of the robots to, you know, uh, basically creating a, a, a new system that will, you know, meet the demands of the future. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And, and, you know, we're, so, so the other part of, so there's, there's a couple of other things that have happened. One is, you know, as we share this vision of this concept of a micro factory, people come back to us and say, okay, we're trying to set up, you know, this manufacturing environment and we think we want your micro factory to be part of it. And it actually took some time for me to, to, to hear this um, and, and to think, what does this mean? Because for me, micro factory is I build robots, I build robots. But, but now picture a micro factory where we have quality systems, 3D printers, um, uh, you have a small assembly of something so you can so people can learn how to build, learn how to run and manage 3D printers, but not necessarily be specifically building a robot. And you know we're taught we're, we're calling these kind of you know the learning micro factory. Um, and the goal is for teaching, not for production. Gotcha. Okay, so it's 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 not quite like those uh, uh, English factories at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution where they had like little you know individual factories for everybody, but it's it's something more than that. It's 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 educational. It's it, it it's kind of like a uh, I don't know, like a it sounds almost like a, a little bit of a testing ground uh, that you're creating. Yeah, it, you know, it's skills skills development, and right. and so um, you know we've connected with uh, uh, a consortium up in up in LA area to provide kind of a whole a whole environment, and you know my you know my co-founder Ryan, our vision was always that we would put micro factories in underserved communities. And, right. and and create then this you know upwardly mobile upwardly mobile jobs and you know the point is automation robotics they're coming and if if people aren't learning this at you know junior high high school whether they want to go to four year college or not you know how how to not be intimidated by robots how to be comfortable with them how to program them i mean th they're going to be locked out of 
what happens next and the next the next revolution. So uh, worst case scenario, you're just getting all of us used to Skynet before it takes over. Well, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's a joke, but I mean, yeah. it's just it's reality. Right. right. And, and when when we if we step back and look at the transition from the agricultural economy to the industrial economy, everything changed. Right. Right. Like you had people who were working, you know, working in the farms, working the fields. And then all of a sudden, oh, you you wanted to have factories where you're weaving cloth. Right. Mm -hmm. And and people would go in and, you know, they call them the Luddites. Right. They they you know, they try to break burn the the factories yeah. and break the looms because you're taking jobs right. away. And what I would tell you is there are there there is no question. There are people today who are going to be impacted negatively because the next generation is a learning economy and we still need people to do things, but we also need them to be able to think and be creative and innovate. And, and we, we want to, you know, bridge robotics wants to be a part of this process. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I think about the stuff, uh, uh, occasionally. And so you're, you're right. So it starts out, you know, agricultural 95, 98% of the workforce was doing that at the beginning of the country. And then it went on to, uh, uh manufacturing, uh, again, probably like 85, 90% of the company or country, they were working in those kinds of jobs and agriculture has gone down to like a couple percent now. Uh, and uh, over the last couple of generations, people have been moving out of manufacturing to service and uh, those types of jobs. And so maybe the future will have a mixture of, I mean, the agriculture is still going to be there no matter what. There's always going to be a couple percent doing that. And then maybe part of the manufacturing mixture that you're talking about uh, will be more of that kind of like hands on and not just repetitive kind of manufacturing that. Uh, people are mostly used to. Yeah, you, you know, when I if I when I think about this, I think we're going to be going more towards smaller smaller factories, even this micro factory concept, where you know you needed in the industrial economy, you needed economy of scale, right? right. You needed big to be able to be efficient. I, I just don't think that's going to be what makes sense. And the downside is that we literally wanted human beings just to be robots, do this for 65 seconds, right? And no one human knew how to build a car. But as as time goes on, I think we need more people who know who, who know the end to end. And that's kind of the idea of what we're doing in our, our micro factory. I have people who know how to build the robot end to end. When something goes wrong, you know, there's there's a number of us. It's like, what do you think? And we'll talk through it and we'll problem solve. And there's constant learning that's happening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so you're, you're seeing that the next step in the evolution of the uh, workforce is going to be more towards creation. Yeah, I like think ma so. Ma mass creation. So I, I know there was a concept just probably like 20, 25 years ago about like mass customization. Is that sort of, is that kind of in the same, is that aligned with what you're talking about? Not quite though, right? Yeah, not not quite, but I think I think it's, it's the combination of build as well as tear down. Right. Right. Okay. Like, like, you know, if you know how to build, then you should know also know how to tear down and can you reuse instead of buying buying new and throwing it out in a dump. So it's it, it, it's more like a uh, clear example of Schumpet, uh, Schumpeter's uh, creative destruction. Exactly. Just, it, just in you know uh, you actually see it as right. opposed to it's just happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So that's that, cool. that's that's where we think things are going, and you know for us. We're focusing on, on, you know, we we found this 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 product market fit with bridged robotics, and so we're focusing on the education part of the business to get started. 
Okay. And so how, how far are you, are you along on this? Do you have any success stories to share? Are you still in the planning stages? Where are you at? Um, you know, so, so uh, we've got, we've got two uh, local universities in uh, Southern California, one community college, one university, one four-year university. The community college has used our robot now for, uh, I think, for two or three semesters. Um, and the students just, they love it. The instructor loves it because he's like, it's very straightforward. It's easy to learn. It's easy to teach. And the students get to, they get hands-on with a robotic arm very early in their process. So, so that's gone very well. And, and, and that community college has, has helped us continue to develop our, our, our labs and, and curriculum. Um, and then uh, uh, the other university uh, bought, bought a couple of arms for their, basically their, their uh, uh, maker lab area. And I mean, students are just like, they want, they're like so excited because they get to work with a robotic arm and be creative with it. Um, one, of, one of the students just for fun, he designed a gauntlet so 3D printed a gauntlet with sensors on it and then use that gauntlet to get the robot to move. Okay. All so right. so it's like, what else can you do? And and the idea is we don't need to have all the ideas. We just need to to uh you know support support as needed, but but let them go. And that university is now looking to um, develop sort of advanced like controls classes around the robot so that, oh, do this and they get the theory plus the practical and they can see what that what that combination is. Yeah, that's music to my ears. I mean, so uh, part of my background was teaching entrepreneurship, right? And uh, a big part of our curriculum was, you know, bridging what you learn in a book uh, with actual practical experience, you know, working with uh, local businesses or working on starting your own business. So 100%, you know, a, a agree with what you're doing there. And so, uh, okay, so wh where do you see yourselves in a few years? I mean, if, if this keeps on growing and being successful, where do you see this, uh, uh, you know, growing out to? Well, you know, there it, there's just no question. There's a huge market for educational robots um, um, globally. And, uh, you know, I, I, my vision, I would love to have, you know, micro factories kind of all over the US and then starting to expand globally that are supporting educational as well as uh, automation needs in their local communities. Right. And I also would love the concept that that. I mean, we just don't think small, I guess, is the best way to put it. I would love that when people say, what should leadership be? They look at, now look at this micro factory and how they treat their people and, and how people are, are developed inside rather than treating human beings like robots or you know just someone to do work that we respect and treat people as humans and, and people are looking at the example that we develop in house and wanting to expand it beyond. Very cool. So, so what what would an example of that expansion beyond be? So, um, you know, or, so this combination of of uh, Arcatas versus Bridge. So, Bridge is focused on on education, but you know, we're having a conversation with somebody about and and about the fact that oh you want to put our robot in this application and they want to and they want to integrate our robot with their product so that so that you don't have to hire people to run the product okay and during those conversations they're like oh so you're going to put these micro factories and service everything 
locally. Oh, well, we have these things that we're having assembled in China. Do you think they could do other assembly work? And the answer is yes, right? It's like whether I build a robot or build something else, I can create this small environment. It, it may not short term be less expensive because you know, quote, the most efficient way to run something is, you know, to do that 65 seconds or run it down an assembly line. But that's just for the product. The end to end to the customer that you've got a local support, local service people, something goes wrong, you can swap it out. You don't have long supply chains. And, you know, I, I think I think this concept of smaller, um, smaller production environments, I think it's going to, I think it's going to jump. And I, I think that is going to be the future. And the only way that really works is you bring people in and, and you're creating this learning environment. Um, and people, you know, there may always be large assembly plants and people who want to just go in and work and leave they're there, but people who want more, who want to do more, want to feel good about themselves at the end of the day, they're going to want to start. I, I believe they're going to start moving closer and closer to, to these smaller micro factory uh, environments. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. And I, you know, looking at just the general uh, evolution of how our economy works. And I think that also because of what happened with COVID a lot of people moved, right? So for myself, I moved from Southern California to Texas. And, you know, here I'm doing an interview with you and you're in Southern California now, and I'm doing the interview for Cal State Fullerton, obviously a Southern California university. And I, I, I see that there's this uh, uh, legitimate way for more and more people to basically live wherever and do most jobs. I mean, you, you could be the CEO of a company uh, that is based in Los Angeles and you could be in Boulder or, right. or you know, Calcutta, wherever right. you are, as long as you have that uh, connection. And on the manufacturing side, I, I definitely see a uh, uh, an opening for that, that kind of local customization that uh, will make economic sense. And if you have the workforce that is able to actually drive that innovation, uh, I, I don't see why it wouldn't work. And I could definitely see, you know, there being kind of, uh, you know, maybe to start off with, they would be uh, uh, micro economies that kind of sprout out around this, but I could see it growing into something more. And so I'm guessing that's that's the vision. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's that's exactly the vision, right? And, you, you know, if you think about what's happened in rural economies all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because you've got these big, huge manufacturing facilities, if you don't have a facility anywhere near where you can work, where's your opportunity? Well, if I can just pop, you know, small, 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 and, and, and it's not me per se, it's the concept of putting smaller things in, in, in smaller uh, communities, you, you can create Upward, you know, I'm back to, I use this word a lot, upward mobility. You're creating right. upside. I mean, to, yeah, basically putting it another way, you're helping to create creators. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. That, I, that, I, that, that is a concept I could wrap my head around. I mean, there's obviously, you know, it's four words uh, or two or three words. Uh, but so there, there's a lot more context behind it, a lot more work that goes into actually doing this. And I'm sure it takes months to get people up to speed but once they're up to speed i mean they're up to speed and then that the, like what they can create you know is only limited by their imagination or the imagination of them and the people that they're working with and exactly. so yeah you could you could live in some small town in middle america or on the coast somewhere or you know in oaxaca mexico or wh wherever the case may be and you if, if you have the access to the tools which are easier and easier to come by you can create a whole host of things you know, it's it's really limit li limitless. So that, that that that's basically it. That what we're talking about right here, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So yeah, I mean, th this uh, has the potential to completely revolutionize everything. But that that's and, how you see it, right? I, I never think small, right? I mean that that's exactly that that's exactly the path we're going. 
well, what's the point of thinking small, right? I mean, you're 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 a startup founder. Uh, if you're not thinking big, then the investors aren't going to come, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, just as a small little tangent on that front, I mean that that that's one of the things that, uh, especially as a professor, I had to you know work with students on was you know, hey, think bigger. You know, I I, I get it. You you can make this into a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollar business. You know, make some money off of it. But uh, you're not going to get investors unless, you know, th that that company can make a few more zeros behind it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. All right. So uh, that's a huge vision. Uh, this was a tremendous conversation. I think we should probably end up pretty, pretty soon. But one last question. So okay. after all of this, after your experience uh, at the, in the Ivy League, at MIT, uh, corporate America, working your way up through that uh, as an entrepreneur with uh, uh, many companies under your belt, working with investors, working with co-founders. Uh, now you're uh, landed in, a, in a, a company that has a very powerful social mission and all this stuff. What advice do you have to you know students over at Cal State Fullerton or wherever, anybody who's thinking about starting their own business? Okay, so um, there is this aspect of like follow the rules um, and the rules being think about think about the business more than just the technology, mm. right? Like if you're trying to create a business, it's like what problem are you trying to solve? Who Who is your customer? It's not just, oh, look at this really cool technology I have. And when I look back, you know, I, I, I took you through my startup, you know, experience, a lot of the early companies, they were actually cool technologies, but really not good businesses. Okay. Number two is, gosh, you know, the best technology, if the timing isn't right, it's not, it's not really, it, it, it may not go anywhere. Um, you know, my Madison, Wisconsin business, the technology was, was really new and unique four years before the business really got started. And, and, you know, the professor just didn't want to let go of it, didn't want to get it funded. And that, that, he would he he could have actually had a real upside if he had let go of it right so so that's that's another piece number 2 is be persistent but also know when it's time to leave right like like when i'm in i'm all in but you need to take a break every so often and step back and say is this a company, right? Is this, is this going to be successful? And if you think so, be like, just don't give up. But if you step back and you say, gosh, I don't know that we can create a company out of this. You know, there's no shame in saying this wasn't the right thing and it could be the wrong timing, the wrong person, the wrong everything. All right. And then the, so you asked me for two or three, but I got a million, right? Um, uh, I'd say the other thing is um, uh, if you're going to either start a company or go into a company, you better make sure that you can that that you understand the values of the people that are going to be sitting around the table with you. And if I look back, probably some of the biggest mistakes were I didn't understand people's values. And and you know, I am very aligned with my values and there are people who aren't so aligned with their own values, but I am. And if I go in and go into business with someone who doesn't have that same alignment, it, I just can't, I can't do that. And, and so it's really important to understand that. All right. And then the final thing I would tell you is it's a good chance that you're going to fail because that's just the way entrepreneurship is. Not every idea is a great idea. And don't let it hit you here. Just step back. What did I learn from this? What do I need to do differently? 
and then go out the next go around. Those are all good. Uh, so the, the first one, especially, I mean, I, I think that uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, they, they're they really more in, inventors, mm -hmm. right? So it's just, oh, it's, it's cool technology. That, that That's good. Uh, but, uh, you know, instead of me trying to uh, recontextualize everything and, and, you know, repeat it in different ways, uh, I will say that I think that you're right, that it, it all sort of matters and that there's a, a million lessons that you could have about entrepreneurship. Uh, so uh, I think we'll leave it at that. Uh, Karen, I mean, unless there's anything else you have to add, uh, thank you very much. Oh, no. Thank, thank you, Travis. This was so much fun just having this converse, conversation and being able to share my 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 BHAG. <laughs> Big, Big hairy, hairy, audacious goals, right? Oh, audacious. That's what the A stands for. Okay. I, I thought yeah. it was something else. <laughs> audacious. Yes. Yeah, audacious. Yeah. Definitely audacious. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. I really appreciate it. The pleasure is all mine. Yep. Thank you.